With fake news and Russian trolls dominating the headlines, the founder of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales, says the news is broken, but he can fix it. I'll ask him how. I'm Mehdi Hassan, also on the show. Though Palestinian activist Issa Amra's non-violent resistance has led him to be dubbed the Palestinian Gandhi, Israel is about to put him on trial in a military court. I'll ask him what he thinks the future holds for the Palestinian struggle. But first, in an era of Trump, fake news and Russian propaganda, tech giants such as Google and Facebook are struggling to find an effective way to stop the spread of disinformation. The founder of online encyclopedia, Wikipedia, says he has the solution and is launching his own news outlet, Wikitribute. But will it work? This week's headliner from London, Jimmy Wales. Jimmy Wales, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Um, you're about to launch a project called Wiki Tribune with the bold objective to, quote, fix the news, uh, to combat the rise of fake news. Uh, Facebook has just announced that they're actually enlisting Wikipedia, which you founded, to help combat fake news. So how big a problem do you think this really is? Is fake news, in your view, the threat to truth and democracy that some seem to think it is? Uh, yes, I do. I think it's a, it's a fairly serious problem, and it's a broader problem than just uh, what I would call pure fake news, i.e. Uh, these websites that have popped up that offer completely counterfeit stories and completely made up nonsense. There's also the broader uh, problem of a, of a rise of relatively low quality media, uh, which is competing with the more traditional, more respectable media uh, in a really aggressive way for clicks and ad revenue and so forth, uh, which is really putting a lot more pressure on journalism than it has already experienced, which has been quite a lot, obviously. And just on the counterfeit stories, Tech giants like Facebook and Google really seem to be struggling with this epidemic of fake news. Just recently after the Las Vegas shooting, stories about fake suspects and fake motives were trending on Facebook, were coming top of the search results for Google News. Uh, it does seem to be the case that even today, these multi-billion dollar search companies and social media companies are failing and failing miserably at stopping the spread of false information, of disinformation. Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I'm sympathetic uh, to the problem uh, that, for example, Facebook faces because if people are sharing things without properly looking at it themselves and it, things are circulating very quickly through uh, networks of very naive consumers, people who aren't sophisticated about the news, uh, well, it's a tough problem for Facebook. And I think in a slightly different set of historical circumstances, we would be all very upset if uh, Facebook had announced two years ago, uh, we're going to decide what's good quality enough for you to share. And we're going to decide if the news uh, is, meets Facebook's approval before mm -hmm. you share it. We would say, ah, no, Facebook is trying to dominate the world. Yeah. But I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that in another couple of years' time, that piece of this puzzle can be solved and will be solved in the same way, uh, well, if you remember a few years ago, everybody was in despair that spam was ruining email and, you know, every time you open your email, you got 50 uh, completely random nonsense, uh, fake, you know, scam yeah. emails and so forth. That problem has been almost completely eradicated uh, through technology and it took a while for the companies to get really serious about combating it, but once they did, they did make progress and, and I think that this, this is a very similar situation. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the Facebook CEO and founder, initially downplayed the role that Facebook may have played in influencing the results of the 2016 U.S. presidential election. In your view, how decisive a role did Facebook, Google, Twitter and the rest play in delivering the White House to Donald Trump? I think it's really hard to say. I, th I think it does appear to have uh, played a significant role. Uh, I do think that the, uh, you know, the Russian influence that has been uncovered so far uh, indicates a fairly high level of sophistication. Uh, this wasn't as simple as simply uh, paying for ads that said Donald Trump is great. It was really more about very complex strategies of voter suppression, of, uh, you know, running ads that were pro-Hillary but associated her with negative groups in the minds of certain voters. Uh, it was a very sophisticated operation in terms of a, uh, a large PR campaign. I think that did have an impact. Uh, how large? I don't think we'll know for, for 10 years. I think historians will have a lot to write about about this era. And 
Oh, you mentioned how sophisticated the Russian operation seems to have been in terms of infiltrating kind of uh, Google, Facebook. This week we discovered kind of the YouTube Google angle in terms of ads. Are you surprised, not just at how sophisticated it was, but that these guys, the big companies, were not able to see it coming, didn't spot this all until way after the election? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I am surprised. I'm surprised that it, that it took them that long to notice it. And it's not like any of these companies is a great fan of Donald Trump. I, in fact, if I had to guess about all the founders, they probably all went in and voted for Hillary. Uh, it was really more a matter of being asleep at the switch and not realizing uh, that this, the scale of what could happen uh, was happening. So how does your new project, Wiki Tribune, propose to solve this problem, Jimmy? Uh, one of the things is that uh, the advertising-only business model uh, has been incredibly destructive for journalism. Uh, you see even quality news outlets are under a lot of pressure to chase after clicks, which tempts people into inflammatory stories, into inflated headlines, uh, and a lack of seriousness. Uh, and so I'm launching Wiki Tribune with no advertising. Uh, and the main reason for that is to really focus the attention of the organization on saying, look, we need people to read to the bottom of something we've written and say, wow, I understand the world in a different way. This is something important. This is something I should contribute to and pay for. So that's one element, is really looking at how can we adjust the business model. The other element is really bringing in a community. Uh, we know from the world of wikis, uh, Wikipedia, Wikia, and so on, that communities can come together and do really good quality work. Of course, it isn't perfect. Nothing's perfect. Uh, but that we have a community who take things very seriously and who really try hard to get it right. And I think we can generate the same thing in, in the world of news, even though today, most uh, websites that, you know, the most we see of community is just, you know, here's the news story and at the bottom here's the, the horrible place where the trolls <laughs> all comment and, and are nasty to each other and to the journalists. And I think there is a better way. I think there's a way to really say let's, let's empower the best members of our communities to come in, help participate, do research, uh, uh, do copy editing, do all the kinds of things that people can do yeah. uh, to do something really interesting it's, and something new. I just want to try and understand how this new crowdfunded news website, Wiki Tribune, would work. If, say, 10,000 people sign up to become supporters of it and start pushing for a particular, maybe random type of story, will you then cover that story no matter how random it is? And if so, how do you then protect yourself from special interests, political parties, foreign governments, uh, from taking advantage of your model to use your website to push their agendas? Well, this is the other element, that you really do need to have balance. So you need to have a strong editorial vision uh, that is about doing quality work uh, in, a, in a very thoughtful way. You need to have a really robust community. I mean, it would be very difficult for somebody with a fake grassroots campaign to come and have any impact whatsoever at Wikipedia, because we have a large uh, community who are very dedicated to, they're more dedicated to Wikipedia than they are to whatever somebody's trying to push on them. Uh, but it's not automatic. I mean, it is about culture, it is about values. I don't think it's something to take lightly, but I also don't think it's an insurmountable issue. Okay, so on that note, you of course founded Wikipedia, the hugely popular online encyclopedia that allows anyone theoretically to write and edit entries, which makes it a pretty obvious target, I would say, for spreading disinformation or trying to spread disinformation and hoax stories. Can you say for a fact today, Jimmy Wales, that the Russians didn't infiltrate the Wikipedia editing community too in some shape or form during the last election? Yeah, I, I can say that. <laughs> How? I mean, I'm sure somebody tried. I'm sure you can find de minimis things around the edges. But the point is, the Wikipedia community is a very robust community. Uh, they take their responsibility very seriously. And they're really good at vetting a news story. So if somebody creates a fake news site uh, that uh, you know, says Pope endorses Trump, well, that might spread virally on Facebook because it's going to spread from people who, uh, you know, I, I don't think we should be condescending. Not everybody needs to be an expert on the news, but people who aren't an expert on the news may say, oh, wow, that's amazing, and they pass it and pass it to their friends yeah. who pass it and pass it and pass it on and on. The Wikipedians would say, wait a second, that seems unlikely. Let's see if we can verify that first. And then they have a debate about the quality of the sourcing and so on and so forth. So it's very difficult when you really bring together a group of thoughtful people uh, to pull the wool over their eyes. Isn't one of the real problems for all of you guys trying to tackle this issue, the huge problem, is that people read what they want to read, mostly just to confirm their own beliefs and biases these days. They live in their own information bubbles, cocoons, silos, and when they do see news that contradicts their identity or their narrative or their ideology, they just dismiss it as fake and move on somewhere else. How is Wiki Tribune going to solve that problem? 
Well, I mean, I, I think human nature is human nature, and nothing has really changed about it. Certainly nothing has changed about human nature in the last two years. I mean, human nature doesn't move that quickly. Uh, and so we've always had the problem of people uh, wanting to confirm their own biases, but I also find that there's a very deep undercurrent of uh, people who say, actually, I want to be challenged. I want to hear something that I disagree with, but that is high quality. Uh, that's actually interesting to a lot of people. Uh, and the evidence for this, in my view, is that Wikipedia is more popular than uh, many of the top newspapers of the world combined. Uh, that people do have a hunger for just very basic, very straight presented facts. Uh, they're maybe a little bit tired of coming to uh, read a news story and getting something that's 50 percent uh, an opinion piece and 50 percent a news story. I think people really do say, actually, I, I want facts. I want something serious. But there is this growing feeling, this unease, that companies, tech giants like Facebook and Google, have become so big that they're now more powerful, influential than nation states, than national governments. Uh, some countries have even appointed ambassadors, I believe, to deal specifically with these companies. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the Facebook CEO, is now rumored to be thinking of running for president in 2020 in the U.S. Do you believe that Facebook and Google have accumulated too much power? They're too big? Uh, no, no, I don't. I mean, I, I think... Uh a lot of these kinds of things are really overblown. I mean, people talk about this sort of thing. People sometimes forget that Apple's profit is still slightly higher than Facebook's revenue. So, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of different things going on in the world. Um, I, I think the, the Internet is still a very dynamic place. Um, you know, media owners of all kinds have always been quite powerful. Um, if I have to trust the world to... Uh, Donald Trump or Mark Zuckerberg, I know which way I'm going. Well, on that note, would you vote for Mark Zuckerberg come 2020? It's <laughs> uh, a good question. I might do. Okay, and have you ever thought of running for office yourself? <laughs> Hope he doesn't run. Uh, not for more than about five seconds. It sounds like a horrific uh, sort of way to engage. It, being in the public eye at all is it's always slightly weird and awkward. Uh, I wouldn't want to invite that abuse. Jimmy Wells, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Great, thank you. Issa Amro has been dubbed the Palestinian Gandhi, a prominent human rights activist in the occupied West Bank who's been recognized by both the EU and the UN. He's been a tireless advocate for nonviolent resistance. You might think he would have been welcomed with open arms by both the Palestinian and the Israeli governments but you'd be wrong. His own Palestinian Authority recently locked him up for almost a week over a Facebook post, and now Israel is putting him on trial in a military court for a series of charges dismissed by international rights groups as baseless. Isa Amro joins me now. Uh, you're a well-known, award-winning Palestinian activist, and despite your nonviolent activism, uh, you've been arrested by Israel, quote, more times than you can count. Uh, your most recent imprisonment, however, was by the Palestinian Authority for comments you made on Facebook. Um, why is the Palestinian Authority cracking down on Palestinian human rights activists? Uh, unfortunately, the Palestinian Authority passed a law called uh, Cybercrime Law, and it uh, violates the Palestinian uh, people's privacy and the Palestinian people's uh, freedom of expression. The Palestinian Authority is trying to shut off anyone who's criticizing the misconduct or misbehavior of many uh, organizations or many uh, institutions or many uh, leaders. That was wrong. I think the law was passed without a, a, a real consultation with the Palestinian civil society or with the Palestinian political leaders, I hope that they drop that uh, law as soon as possible. So there's no doubt that the main enemy of the Palestinians is the Israeli occupation. But in terms of the actual everyday problems facing Palestinian society today, the latest opinion polls of Palestinian public opinion show that the public there ranks things like poverty, unemployment, corruption, above the Israeli occupation and the settlement activities as problems in their everyday life. Shouldn't rights activists on the ground like yourself be focusing your energies first and foremost, therefore, on your own government and your own problems at home before tackling the outside problems? Uh, Is that fair? It's fair, yes. Uh, I think that uh, Abu Mazen in the UN said it clear that we are authority without an authority. And the uh, occupation is affecting all what you said. The occupation is affecting the Palestinian unemployment high rate. The occupation is affecting everything. But the occupation is trying to skip and put us on uh, a direct confrontation. The occupation doesn't force Palestinian leaders to be corrupt, though, does it? 
corruption is wrong everywhere, and uh, in a way or another, they give them incentives. You know, they, they, in a way or another, the occupation is giving some leaders VIPs, uh, PMCs, uh, BM, businessmen cards. So the occupation is the main yeah. uh, source of uh, oppression and the mo main source of corruption, and even you know, crackdown on the. Palestinian. Although the occupation didn't force the Palestinian Authority to arrest you, in a way or another, no. But, you know, it's connected. OK. Well, let's turn to Israel and the occupation. Um, you're a prominent advocate for nonviolent protest. How effective has nonviolent protest been in the occupied territories, do you think, from your own experiences? Uh, Palestinians have very long experience with the nonviolence resistance. And I think that civil disobedience is the only uh, method to end the occupation. These days in, in West Bank, the, the Israel is afraid of that. We, in the ground, we managed to do a lot to strengthen the Palestinian steadfastness uh, in front of the Israeli settlers uh, and the Isra Israeli in, in justice. We do a lot of protesting. We managed to, in a way or another, to highlight the segregation, the apartheid policies, the discrimination in, in West Bank and Gaza and uh, Jerusalem. This is how we can manage to stop Okay. the settlement expansion and stop uh, all the attacks on the Palestinian people. And what do you say to Israelis who see you talking non-violence in this very eloquent way, but then see other Palestinians advocating violence? They witness this so-called stabbing intifada with an Israeli family, for example, stabbed to death during dinner. A 13-year-old Israeli girl stabbed to death while she slept in her bedroom. Uh, in fact, the Israelis say there have been 184 stabbing attacks and 129 attempted stabbings against Israelis since 2015. Do you see that disconnect? Uh, in the contrary, the majority of the Palestinian uh, resistance is a non-violence resistance. And we also, the, how the Palestinians mobilized their movement against the metal detectors outside Al-Aqsa Mosque in, in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Thousands and thousands of Palestinians were praying in the streets, and they practiced uh, non-violence resistance as it is uh, according to the international yeah. consensus. Uh, Palestinians are, uh, let's say, sometimes they have individual act. And I think the majority of the children were killed out of law. And it's extrajudicial execution how the soldiers killed uh, a Palestinian, 15 years old Palestinian girl or boy. No that one, is extrajudicial and execution. And no one's defending the Israeli occupying forces. I'm asking, according when to Israelis see you speak about non-violence, they also wonder, well, does this guy condemn all of the stabbing attacks that we've seen happen? many stabbing attacks. You wouldn't deny them. Do you condemn those attacks? For sure, I, I, I'm against any kind of uh, violence, and I condemn them for many reasons. We should highlight the occupation. We should hi highlight apartheid discrimination and highlight the Palestinian community resistance Just, against the occupation. Is it true that you talk down one young Palestinian who was planning an attack of this manner? Uh, I convinced him to use non-violence resistance and to uh, work against the occupation for long term. I don't want him to do one act, then he loses uh, his uh, life. That is very uh, wrong. But we should protect our uh, children from the Israeli oppression and from the Israeli uh, fanatic and extreme soldiers who kill uh, a 15 years old uh, child for having a knife and sometimes without a knife even. Many people will listen to you and say, fine, but Palestinians do have a legal right to resist violently. It's guaranteed under international law. You're up against a violent occupying army. You yourself have been beaten and assaulted by Israeli troops. Surely you can understand why so many of your fellow Palestinians over the years who have been assaulted, shot at, imprisoned, had their houses demolished, lived under illegal occupation for 50 years, might want to fight back and not just have a peaceful sit-in, not just do civil disobedience. No one's justifying any attacks on civilians, of course. But if a Palestinian under occupation wants to fight back against an Israeli soldier illegally occupying their land, what's wrong with that in your view? Uh, it's not about what is wrong. It's not about armed resistance versus uh, non-violence resistance. You know, in the contrary, it's uh, uh, the, the armed resistance is allowed according to the international law to resist uh, the occupiers. But it's about tactics and what mm. is possible and what you win, how you will win. Mm. Palestinians practiced uh, popular resistance in the, in the first intifada and it went very well and we, we, we were achieving a lot and we all uh, participated in that uh, resistance. Do you think the second intifada, the second which was identified, you know, defined by suicide terror attacks in the eyes of the West. We least. lost a lot from that, that, that uh, intifada, and the price was very, very high. So it's about tactics and strategies and use what uh, type of resistance w w w will make you stronger. And nowadays we are completely sieged. We, we are living in a, almost a big jail in, in West Bank. So nonviolence 
as a tactic now is the best so, tool to end the occupation. So just to be clear, you're not objecting to the moral or legal right of Palestinians to fight back. You're saying from a pragmatic point of view, it doesn't work. This way is a, a better way in terms Exactly. Of this is a better way and this is uh, something we can use and win with it now. I think civil disobedience will make the cost of the occupation higher. How we can make the cost of the occupation higher? We can make it through the, our non-violence tactics and our non-violence uh, methodology. After numerous arrests, you're currently facing a military trial in Israel on charges that the UN believes to be unjustified, which were denounced by Amnesty International, among others, as baseless, politically motivated. You've also been beaten by Israeli soldiers, harassed by Israeli settlers outside your home. Right -wing, some right-wing Zionist websites have even suggested you should be executed uh, for your crimes against Israel, so-called. Do you worry that if you're convicted and sent to prison, and just for the sake of our international audience, the Israeli military court system has a, something like a 98, 99% conviction rate. Um, do you worry that if you are convicted, as looks likely, it will discourage other Palestinians from adopting the non-violent approach that you have? Uh, first of all, it's not, it's not court. The military court, it's a show. Uh, it's a military judge accepts what the military investigator asked him to do. So the military courts are exist to strengthen the occupation and prolong the occupation and uh, attack anyone who resists the occupation. So I don't think that I will get fair trial or it will be justice in that court. And the conviction rate is the best ex example of how Palestinians can't escape from the military court at so all. So why accept the court? Why turn up for the trial even? Uh, if you know you're going to be convicted. I hope that, you know, uh, that the, the the Palestinians will have uh, a consensus among the Palestinian society to boycott the Israeli military court, but I can't be uh, alone, you know, to do that. And I want to advocate how Israel Hold is on. attacking Palestinians. Boycott a court? If they send you to prison, you can't boycott that. You, you're can, willing to I, go to prison. I can, you know, I will go to prison, and I will not go to the court. You know, I will refuse to go to court, but they will take me to prison, and they can rule as, or they take me against my will to the court. I know many Palestinian individuals did that, but they they doubled their sentence, or it, till now it's not. Uh, uh, you're, you're, you're saying it very casually almost. You're sitting here right now in this studio outside of the West Bank, outside of Israel, a free man effectively in the sense that you can walk out of it any time you like. But you're saying, no, I'm going to go back, I'm going to take part in this show trial, and I'm going to go to prison, and you're fine with that. How do you get into that mindset? I'm not fine with that. I, w I don't want to go to prison, and I don't think we have any Palestinian wants to go to prison. In the country, we want freedom, and we want justice. But I, it's part of my struggle. But part of my struggle to teach the international community who is asking us day and night to do nonviolence resistance, tell them who is the occupation, how they attack human rights defenders, how they take me to trial with 18 military charges, and at the end of the day, they will take me to jail for a few years for practicing only nonviolence resistance. I want to give out a message that Israel is not a democracy. It's a country which doesn't respect uh, any kind of international treaties. Israel doesn't respect uh, human rights defenders or any uh, human and rights. That requires uh, you going to prison to, for that message to be heard. That's there the is no change pay. without a price. And, you know, and sacrifice, you know. A lot of Israelis have said over the years, where is the Palestinian Gandhi? Partly as a way of deflecting international criticism of their occupation. They say, well, there's no one to talk to. They're all, they're all violent. They're all Hamas. They're all suicide bombers. That's the claim from the Israelis. There's no, there's no Palestinian Gandhi. You've been dubbed a Palestinian Gandhi. You're a non-violent activist. Do you think that's why you're being targeted by the Israelis? Because the Israelis don't want an actual Palestinian Gandhi who they have to sit down and talk to? One of the general uh, of the Israeli general said to the media that they can't play Gandhi. You know, they they can't go and fight Gandhi. And this is why they attack me as a Palestinian non-violence activist. And this is why they attack many Palestinian human rights defenders and non-violence activists all over Palestine. I'm not. I'm, I'm not the only one yeah. who, who was attacked. Maybe I have more opportunities to, to speak about what is happening to me, but I have a friend of mine who is a human rights lawyer, and we are both in the same trial. I have many other friends who were, who were in jail for practicing nonviolence. Israel is trying to uh, uh, prevent any uh, revolution 
anyone who will go and become a, a Gandhi in, in the Palestinian uh, land. They don't want the international community to see that Palestinians are using nonviolent resistance to use the same excuses of, uh, of uh, security, because everything for Israel is security. They forget that they are occupiers and they have apartheid system and they, are, they have discrimination. So we are taking off the security excuse from them when we use nonviolent resistance. Issa Amram, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Thank you very much. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.